I am Carla Luciana Kostjeninger. I am from Brazil. Currently, I'm doing my doctoral studies in literature at Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. I am doing my research in Germany in a sandwich doctoral program at Potsdam University. And I am also a teacher at Aupilha Federal Institute in Brazil. Today, I'm going to do a short presentation on one of the novels is the core of my research. about the writer's provisional beliefs and analysis of Elizabeth Costello chapter at the gate by Coetzee. This paper aims to analyze the chapter at the gate, segment of the novel Elizabeth Costello by John Maxwell Coetzee. The protagonist Elizabeth Costello is a renowned Australian novelist created by the author. Along the narrative, she gives eight lectures in different institutions around the world in countries and continents. The eighth chapter at the gate illustrated the moment when the writer in the end of her life has to be judged. For that, she needs to write a statement on her own beliefs. John Maxwell Coates was born in Cape Town, South Africa. He is a novelist and essayist and a literary critic. Authorship, process of writing and philosophical reflections are recurrent themes in his literary texts. For this specific study, the theoretical approach includes the role of a writer, negation, and writer's beliefs, according to Maurice Blanchot, the freedom of a writer in literature, this strange institution which allows one to say everything, as states Jacques Derrida, and the destruction of beliefs as the symbolic murder in line with Maurice Pons. At the gate, the literary freedom and negation. For Elizabeth Costello, Coetzee brings a protagonist who is a fictional writer. She was born in 1928, Melbourne, Australia. She lived in England and France. Uh, she was married twice and has two sons. And she's almost 67. Along her career, she published nine novels and two poem books. The protagonist travels around the world giving lectures and speeches at different universities. The structure of the narrative of Elizabeth Costello is made up of eight lectures and one postscript. At the gate. Uh, in this chapter, uh, this one begins with an old woman, Elizabeth Costello, getting out of a bus in a square with many people. She sees a gate and asks the guard to open it. He indicates a cabin on the side. A man guided her saying she has to write a statement before her crossing. She asks, statement about what? And the man answers, about beliefs, in what you believe. Elizabeth made many attempts, mentions Kafka, Homer, Tesla Milos, Dostoevsky, Hirky, and Van Gogh, to exemplify, reflect, and support her arguments. Since the moment she is requested to write, she cannot escape from the role of, and responsibilities a writer has. This influence a lot in the process of writing due to the knowledge she has of poems, theories, novels, and a vast bagage that constitutes her, is part of her. She's unable to undress woven garments over time, along her time. At the gate, Elizabeth follows her own convictions and says what she wants or what she thinks should be said in her defense as a writer, in front of the judges, Costello reads the second attempt of statement, citation, I am a writer, and what a writer is, what, what I write is what I hear. I am a secretary of invisible. That is my calling, dictation secretary. I merely write down the words and then test them, test their soundness, to make sure I have heard right. End of citation. Elizabeth designates herself as a secretary of the invisible. She argumentes that she only writes down the words that came to her. She writes everything comes to her to test the words, their meanings and effects. This can be an attempt to dismiss the culpability. 
through literature, everything can be said, thoughts, reflections, judgments, and critics. Words, description, narration, characters carry on the capacity of a speech that influences lives. Jacques Derrida brings in this strange institution called literature, a definition of literature like an institution with a sense of democracy and where one can say everything. Citation. What is literature? Literature as historical institution with its conventions, roles, etc. But also this institution of fiction, which gives in principle the power to say everything, to break free of the rules, to displace them, and thereby to institute, to invent. Not that it depends on a democracy in place, but it seems inseparable to me from what calls forth a democracy in the most open and doubtless itself sense of democracy, end of citation. When using the expression secretary of invisible, it means she is allowed to break the rules, displace them, suspect the traditional and conventional and to invent. This carries on the works she publishes in the past and to her statement, a sense of democracy. This sense provides her the opportunity to accurate the words the voices she hears. Costello emphasizes that she borrows this designation, which is not by her. Citation Yes, I borrow it from a secretary of a higher order, Ceslo Milos, a poet perhaps known to you, to whom it was dictated years ago. End of citation. In the original poem, Secretaries, the poet of Polish language. Serlos Milons mentions the writing as a continuous process and the comparison of a writer's role with secretary's duties. The poet is like someone who organizes files, transcribes ideas, takes notes from voices that comes to him, dictated by powers beyond us. These dictated voices reveal the existence of a certain license for a writer to say everything he or she can or what is possible. Thus, there is a protection from religions or political censorship. Yohida points out that the writer cannot stop being involved, interested, uneasy about the past. It refers to culture in general, history, and philosophy. These voices must, must be heard, respected, and right out. A writer is like a responsible hair. hair. Like the protagonist who does not give up of ideas associated to culture. Other feature considered over at the gate is the negation of beliefs Elizabeth expresses. In the beginning of the chapter, she asks, citation, believe is that all, not a statement of faith? What if I do not believe? What if I am not a believer? End of citation. Costello denies any belief. Later on, she explains the reason of the negation. Citation, a good secretary should have no beliefs. It is inadequate for the duty. Should merely be in readiness waiting for a call. End of citation. The protagonist has doubts about her final statement. statement. As a writer, a secretary of invisible, she recognizes it is relevant to not have stable beliefs. In this sense, Maurice Blanchot articulates perceptions about freedom and negation. Citation. What is an author capable of? He denies everything he is in order to become everything he is not. In this sense, his work is a prodigious act, the greatest and most important there is. End of citation. The French philosopher highlights that a writer produces his text in a free world, denying everything on behalf of art. As Elizabeth denies her beliefs, citation, of course, gentlemen, I do not claim to be bereft of all belief. I have what I think of as opinions and prejudice, not different in kind from what are commonly called beliefs. When I'm Claim to be a secretary clean of belief, I refer to my ideal self, a self capable of holding opinions and prejudice at bay while the world, which, is, which it is, 
her function to conduct passes through her. Negative capability, says the little man. Is negative capability what you have in mind? What you claim to possess? End of citation. Costello negates the limits. The walls cannot frighten, arrest, or secure her. She has no convict beliefs, but has convictions on her role as a writer, exhibited in her previous books. About the writer's provision of beliefs. The protagonist Elizabeth Costello stays for some days in a strange city. For her, it seems like an Italian city. All day she faces the gate and tries to write an acceptable statement. According to a dictionary of symbolism, the gate is an entry into an unknown place or a place of great significance. It is a threshold and may con connect the living and the dead. The city was like a purgatory, a necessary place to process the purification or temporary punishment, a condition in which souls in a state of grace become ready for heaven. When she was asked to write about her beliefs, she declares, imitation, I am a writer, I do imitation, as Aristotle would have said, end of citation. Here she uses the term imitation as creation of art, like Aristotle in the Poetics. For the philosopher, the imitation represents men's characters, what they do and suffer. This representation occurs in prose or verse. The region of poetry is part of human nature, so as imitation. Animals and humans learn at first by imitation. Aristotle describes a poet as an imitator. Citation. The poet being an imitator, just like the painter or other maker of likeness. He must necessarily in no instance represent things. End of, end of citation. Aristotle asserts that a poet does all of this in language, with a combination of strange words, metaphors, and modified form of words. The representation is crucial for Costello. By writing, she represents human action, thought, and opinions. Elizabeth Costello continues, continues her speech. Station. I am a writer, a trader in fictions. It says, I maintain beliefs only provisionally. Fixed beliefs would stand in my way. I change beliefs as I change my habitation or my clothes according to my needs. I request exception from a rule of which I know here from the first time. End of citation. Besides saying she is a secretary of invisible, she also does imitation based on Aristotle approach and later she designates herself as a traitor in fiction. All these denominators carry the wave of culpability on ideas, thoughts, and authorial reflections. Here, Costello underlines that as a writer, she sustained only provisional beliefs because fixed beliefs could influence, bother, and interfere in her process of writing. The two possibilities are at issue, belief and in credulity. Maurice Ponty underlines that a philosopher needs to abandon belief and incredulity. Citation. The philosopher must abandon these true, true views. He must appeal beyond them to himself. He must lose them as a state of fact in order to reconstruct them as his own possibilities in order to learn from himself what they mean in truth, what delivers him over the both perception and to fantasy, is a word he must reflect, end of citation. For him, the abandonment of belief and incredulity means that the writer or philosopher must be beyond, see beyond these concepts, reflect on them and reconstruct them on his own perspectives. Along the chapter, Elizabeth presents the negation of beliefs, credulity, but at the same time states she has provisional beliefs according to the right he needs. These ideas appeared in text, books, through opinions and sensations. Station. The destruction of beliefs, the symbolic murder of the others and of the world of the world. 
this split between vision and visible, between thought and being do not, as they claim, establish us in the negative. When one has subtracted it, all that, one styles oneself in what remains in sensations, opinions, ends of, ends of citation. As a writer, she thinks her case is different and that judges should consider her provision, professional reasons for not have fixed beliefs. The judges know about her career and uses her bibliography highlighting that her works make judgment, exposes opinions, reflection on different issues. Her books explore the complexities of human conduct. As Ponty states, belief and incredulity, visible and invisible, brings to a right the possibility to work on new perspective, perception, and motivation. Many questions emerge from Elizabeth beliefs, about Elizabeth beliefs, but it is visible that her intense ideas of social justice, politic, and human-animal relation are not suitable to the beliefs they are trying to impose her. Costello carries forward her doubts on her own beliefs. Forward Elizabeth ponders about beliefs and spirit. Citation. I believe in the irreprehensible human spirit. What that is what she should have told her judges. I believe that all humankind is one. And I believe that I am. I believe that what stands before you today is I. End of citation. Finally, she realized her beliefs are on human spirit and asks for the judges to evaluate her based on who she really is, only a human. When Elizabeth was thinking about her past, the protagonist remembered there were times when people believed in artists and in the power, power of art, a different kind of belief, which she considers pertinent. She articulates the following idea, citation. When she was young, in a world now lost and gone, one came across people who still believed in art, or at least in the artist, who tried to follow in the footsteps of the great masters. No matter that God had failed and socialism, there was still Dostoevsky to guide one, or Rilke, or Van Gogh, with the bandaged ear that stood for passion. Has she carried that childish faith into her late years and beyond? Faith is the artist and his truth. End of citation. People could also believe in ideologies, in masters of thinking, in philosophers, leaders, poets, novelists, and painters, each one bringing one's own through a rev revolutionary idea, reflection on human verses, prose, and ink. Regarding to the artist's potential and influence, Elizabeth Costello alludes to Kafka. Her situation at the gate is like a Kafkian situation in which there are very complicated and scary conditions. Sometimes it involves persecution, paranoia, and it is like something or someone manipulates one's life. Costello emphasizes that some elements are common in Kafka's novel. Citation. It is the same with the Kafka business, the wall, the gate, the sentry, and straight out of Kafka, end of citation. The same components present in the trial by Franz Kafka, especially when a priest told, tells a story to the main character, K, about a man's judgment, such as Costello waits before the gate, the man in narrative waits before the gate either. And the guard at Sentry does not allow his passage. The man stayed for days and years. He had many attempts, but without success. When mentioning Kafka, she recognized that her case was like a parody. Citation. Kafka, but only the superficies of Kafka. Kafka reduced it and flattened it to parody. End of citation. The Kafkian protagonist, Ka, leaves moments of apprehension and incertitude before a judgment he even does not know what the accusation is about. 
there were many summonses, interrogations during the process. He always declared innocence, independent of the accusation they made. Readily, everything would be transformed in verity. He thinks in writing a statement in his defense. Elizabeth continues the writing process of a statement. In the next that she writes, she uses the analogy with the frog's life cycle in Revealed Dulgano. Memories from her childhood emerge. Citation, the mud frogs of the Dulganon are a new departure for her. There is something about them that obscurely engages her. End of citation. As a child, she uses to observe the frogs in the mud, amphibians that have and this, that have an interesting process from birth until adult phase. The metamorphic process carries curious meanings. This is a segment of her declaration. Citation. Because today I am before you not as a writer, but as an old woman. In my account, for whose many failings I beg your pardon, the life cycle of the frog may sound allegorical, but to the frogs themselves, it is no allegory. It is the thing itself, the only thing, end of, end of citation. The allegory described in her resulting statement demonstrates a change in her arguments and a literary way to express her reflection on beliefs. The frogs suddenly appear in the river, the river, but mysteriously, they were always there. She explained that in dry season, they create a little tomb for themselves to protect them from heat. They completely merge, merge it in mud, and the night stays silent. But this silence is only until the next rain, after month, that the lives return. Using the allegory, allegory of frogs, she could better understand her own beliefs on death and life. Sometimes, as for frogs, that need to keep silence and have a momentary, momentary death. In literature, the writer or his book needs to keep silence. From the silence, he and or his work emerge transformed, bring ideas, concepts, and hope for the readers. Finally, when creating this allegory of frogs, Elizabeth Costello realizes that she is a believer. Citation. In fact, now that she thinks of it, she, la she lives in a certain sense by belief. She lives in a, by belief. Her mind, when she is truly herself, appears to pass from one belief to the next, pausing, balancing, and moving on. She lives by belief. She works by belief. She is a creator of belief. What a relief. Should she run back and tell them, her judges, before they disrobe and before she changes her mind? End of citation. Nevertheless, she could not cross the gate. Conclusion. At the gate, Elizabeth Costello is a human, a woman, a writer, waiting for her final judgment. At the beginning of the chapter, in her defense, she said she had, to, she had no beliefs. But forward, she analyzes her condition carefully. For days, she lives a process of comprehension, demanding a long self-reflection. In her arguments, she designated herself as trader and fictions, secretary of invisible and imitator. Each one brings the idea of negation by denying the responsibility of the writer text, of the written text. A trader in fictions only deals, negotiates with ideas and maintains beliefs only provisional. A secretary of invisible, based on the poet Millers, only writes what is dictated, writes vo voices from others and, and an imitator, as Aristotle uses in the poetics, carries the concept of imitation of man actions. By using these terms, she considers herself protected from accusation. Therefore, as a strange institution which allows one to say everything, literature enables her to say everything she wants. In literature, with its sense of democracy, 
she is free to break rules and to invent. In front of the gate, Costello resists and negation is evident. Elizabeth's negative capability indicates the abandonment of beliefs, a symbolic murder. She denies her beliefs and with this the possibility to cross the gate. For a long time, she was convicted of her ideas. Her inquietude caused by the special fidelities results in declaring that as a writer, she has only provisional beliefs. Fixed beliefs could influence and disturb her. After many attempts in this rite of passage and preparation to heaven, Elizabeth Costello finally comprehends that she lives by belief, she works by belief, she is a creator of a creature of belief. Thus, having Elizabeth Costello, for instance, it is visible that a writer constructs oneself over negation and provisional beliefs. Even the effect is an uns uncertain destiny. And these are the references. Thank you.